Hello everyone and welcome to part 2 of my little rampage through Unity of Command 2's Blitzkrieg DLC campaign. And as promised, today we'll cover the rest of the historical branch of the campaign, but first a few tips. A few ideas I'd like to share having played most of the DLC. One, compared to the original Allied campaign, I found the DLC to be much more generous with prestige, which is a cue for you not to be a cheapskate and buy up those cards during conferences. Flying artillery, air supply, air supports and paratroopers will save you a lot of pain during the missions, so feel free to use them, they're not that valuable in terms of prestige. Another crucial investment are the HQ abilities, and some of them are clearly better than others. It's worth pointing out that we're presented with two types of HQs in the DLC. On the one hand, you've got your standard army group HQ, and on the other hand, there's the Panzergruppe, the mobile HQ. The basic difference is that the standard HQs have low fixed speed and long range, and the mobile HQs have low fixed range and a high speed, making it possible for them to to follow your mobile troops. And here's your first priority in choosing HQ skills. Because of their low speed, standard HQs need as much range as possible. You don't want to be a hex too far from a destroyed bridge and have to wait for two turns because of that. The next priority is the logistics branch of the HQ skills, specifically the emergency supply and the oversupply unit abilities. Most of the difficult missions in the DLC involve your troops breaking through and then just running towards the objectives on the other side of the map. For example, the oversupply unit ability will give you an additional turn of supply when you don't have a permanent source of supply, for whatever reason, giving you more wiggle room in achieving those distant objectives. Finally, because you don't have nearly infinite recon planes like in the original campaign, the intel branch is rather useful and will spare you a few nasty surprises. The set piece attack and fire superiority skills are still nice and useful, but I haven't found them to be as much of a priority as the other ones that I've mentioned. Kampfgruppe, which is a new feature that comes with German HQs, seems like an interesting idea, but I just haven't found myself using it at all. So if you have any experience with this skill, good or bad, please let me know in the comments. My final piece of advice is to do a little inventory at the end of every mission. Use command points and the reorg step ability to strip any units that will not participate in the campaign any further of any specialists and excess steps so that you have a bigger reinforcement pool during the following missions. Also, if you have some time and enemies left in the mission once you have taken all of the objectives, don't end the mission. Use this as an opportunity to grind some experience because the difference between a regular and a veteran unit and a veteran and an elite unit is enormous and can make future battles much easier. Easier. And now let's look into the mostly historic missions with a trip to the Low Countries. After the relatively easy battles in Norway, the Low Countries mission will try hard to take you down a notch. The relatively weak but numerous Dutch and Belgian armies, plus the British and French hordes coming from the southwest to reinforce them, will try hard to spoil your day, but fear not, there are a few things you can do to increase the chances of your success. The opening moves are critical. See that Dutch capitulation white flag? It better go up on turn 1, as it turns all of the Dutch troops into stragglers. With some luck, you can actually take the objective with the surrounding standard and motorized infantry units, without engaging your paratroopers. As the Dutch fall, you can easily take Amsterdam and Rotterdam on turn 1, and send some of those landed guys to stage a small attack on Antwerp, and soften up its defenses as you send your paratrooper units into the city. Finally, a banner mail has to go down on turn 1, and the force is something you'll have to brute force with engineers and infantry and maybe tanks. Expect losses, but your goal is to be on the other side of that river on turn 1. And so at the end of turn 1, we're just left with Brussels, Mong, and Namur. 
Your next milestone is getting as many tanks and motorized infantry unit close to Namur by the end of turn 2. This is where the most difficult part of the mission starts, as you will have to deal with all of the French and British forces, which are considerable and strong. Try to split them and break their supply lines between Brussels and Mong and deal as much damage as you can. Make sure you use strong units to occupy Brussels and Mong. The enemy are very prone to counterattacks and will use every opportunity to kick you out of those cities. They actually can manage to destroy your paratrooper units in Antwerp, but that objective is pretty easy, it's not urgent, and the whole point of sending paratroopers there is not to take the city, rather than to divert some of the enemy forces to attacking or surrounding it. This can be very helpful dealing with the more difficult objectives in the south. Prepare for what probably is the most frustrating scenario in the entire historic branch. Sickle Stroke will not forgive mistakes and will require some luck in winning. The initial milestone for you is reaching Dinan Crossing and Sedan Crossing by the end of turn 2. This will enable you to comfortably take both of these objectives on turn 3 as required. Dinan crossing is the easier of the two, especially if the bridge is not blown, make sure you repair it. It is also a good place to set up a supply hub with all of the transport capacity you've got. Unfortunately, Sedan crossing will not be as obliging and will take two flying artillery uses for you to break through it. But as soon as you break through, go in and go in hard, because long is the hardest objective on this map, both in terms of being able to take it on time and then keeping it. Because the French and the British are still in the Brussels mode and will counterattack hard. And this is where you will need some luck in getting as many overruns as you can and destroying as many enemies as you possible. In the north, advance as fast as you can and your next milestone is preventing the AI from blowing up the bridge in front of Arras. You can also block the railways between Amiens and Long, denying the enemy their reinforcements and supply. Supply that your units may be short of at Arras. I prefer using flying artillery on that town and just taking it as quickly as possible. Your lines will be very stretched at that point, so make sure you protect the town and the bridge and the road leading up to it so you can keep your units supplied. From there on, send your best supplied units to Advil and Calais, which probably will not be protected, and then to Amiens, which you'll probably have to attack from the flank and the rear because the obvious direct route will be blocked by the counter-attacking British forces. Dunkirk is a fun little scenario, and if you do a few things right, it's not too hard to manage. The most difficult objective there is not losing too many of your mechanized troops, including your motorized infantry and your tanks. Unfortunately, the AI is aware of this and will try hard to prevent you from fulfilling that objective. Another piece of bad news is that you will have to go to the area around Amiens because of the enemy prisoner requirement. The pockets are around Dunkirk simply doesn't produce the prisoners you need to fulfill that objective. And the area around Amiens is a place where you can very easily lose quite a lot of armor. So my approach there is not to worry about losses, use your infantry hard and send them to die, split the enemy forces there between Amiens and that little river in the west to prevent the enemy mobile troops ganging up on your motorized infantry or tanks, and in general don't leave your armored and mechanized troops in situations where they can be easily surrounded and pummeled. The rest of it is relatively easy. Make sure you use the reorganized step ability of your HQs to accumulate your artillery in certain critical units that will strike at Calais in the Belgian capitulation hex and capture these hexes on turn one. Well, you have to take Calais on turn one. Anyway, that white flag next to Belgian capitulation should be a red flag for you. This has to happen as quick 
quickly as possible, especially since you have that take prisoners objective. With that done, penetrate into the enemy ranks, split the pockets into a few smaller pockets, and then crush them. Make sure you take Dunkirk, because it will unlock the option of attacking Switzerland, something that we'll talk about soon. When presented with a choice of going either Feilhort East or Feilhort West, I recommend going with the latter because I found that West is slightly less demanding on your troops and you really don't have to spend too much prestige on reinforcing or strengthening them. So your first and the most critical milestone in this mission is to break through hard at Amiens and take Paris on turn two. It's very possible to reach the city and the French usually leave it undefended, so go into it and leave the rest of their defensive line effectively without supplies. The next milestone is advancing from Paris towards Song, breaking through to Le Havre and securing the railway between Paris and Rouen. Setting up a supply hub nearby would be a good idea and once you have taken Le Havre and Song, it's time to destroy the remaining resistance and send your mobile troops towards the west to take all of those distant objectives. It pretty much has to be one division per objective and do that as soon as you can. The oversupply ability of your HQs will come very helpful here. You will also be given lots and lots of infantry reinforcements, use them to secure the defensive line at Paris and then advance towards Orléans. Also, don't repeat a mistake I made once in sending a cavalry unit towards a distant objective, because while fast, it's still slower than motorized infantry and will, well, not manage to do it in time. Alright, welcome to the most difficult mission of this conference. Feilhot East will see you breaking through the Maginot Line in at least four locations, so let's look at them. Your principal assault will be at Reims, and make sure there's enough of a bridge for your tanks to go through, and Reims itself can be taken on turn one. It's also worth noting that fortified enemy units are not mobile and will not try to break your supply lines or take any objectives so use it to your advantage. The next breakthrough will be at that place where two rivers meet, in front of Herasgruppe A. Build a few bridges there during the reinforcement phase and send that reinforcing infantry you'll get in the subsequent turns into the breach. The next point is next to Luxembourg, which I think is less important, but it can distract enemy mobile units from defending elsewhere. The final breakthrough, and this one is critical, is at Saarbrücken. Advancing there is critical for taking Metz in time. Don't worry about any of the troops next to the Rhine, you are kind of nudged towards crossing the river, but I found that it doesn't work and you can actually take Belouz by attacking it from the west. Once you achieve those breakthroughs and Reims is yours, your tanks and motorized infantry must go south. One to Auxerre and Besançon each, and the rest should go towards Nancy. The Infantry breakthroughs must be directed towards encircling Metz. An important sticking point here is that little forested area between Reims and Metz. It's heavily protected, but it's the only way you can bring supplies by railway into the middle of the map. Yeah, you really need to take that little stretch of railway. And don't worry about infantry losses too much. Once the railway is yours, you can comfortably set up a supply hub at Troyes and then just send uh, a motorized infantry unit towards Auxerre and Nevers, and then do the same for Besançon and Lyon. There will be a couple of enemy units plopped in the center of the map around Dijon, and make sure you block and destroy them, especially the tank, which can screw your mission over and force you to restart it. Back to Metz and Nancy. These towns should be encircled by turn 5, at which point uh, you should send at least three tank units towards Mulhouse, and that's the way to actually take that objective. By this point, the units around Mulhouse will have been out of supply 
supply for a few turns and destroying them will not be a problem. While taking an RC, a miss is a matter of cornering the defenders, wiping them out and taking the towns. I've already said that the developers of this game seemed not to be horrible people, and Tannenbaum, aka the invasion of Switzerland, is another piece of evidence supporting that. The battle is very easy except for that little sticking point in the Alps and Gotthard, as you cannot use your mobile troops there because of the mountainous terrain, so preparation is important here. Give engineer and artillery steps to your mountaineer troops and reinforce them as much as possible. Their objective will be to handle that road leading to Gotthard and eventually taking the objective. In the plains, the Swiss are complete pushovers, attack along all of the roads that lead into the country, and my only comment here is that Luzern is the only place where you can seriously screw this up, so make sure you use your mobile troops correctly and deal as much damage to the potential defenders as possible. Alright, the last conference in the historical branch of the campaign teleports us into the spring of 1941, and the first operation that we will lead, Unternehmen 25, makes you realize how incredibly huge Yugoslavia was. The objectives are all over the place, and instead of truncating the map, as I usually do, I'll discuss the northern and the southern parts of the scenario, one after another. So, in the north, your the first objective is Maribor, which must be taken on turn 1, and obviously do it, but keep in mind that the infantry you have there will be responsible for capturing Zagreb as well, so in addition to just taking Maribor, make sure they advance as far as possible. Send the mountain infantry in Klagenfurt to attack that mountain pass in front of them, and once they are done with the shopping, advance with your Italian troops towards Ljubljana, but don't engage the enemy yet, the losses will not be worth it. This is more to scare the AI than anything else. The tank division next to Najikanisha breaks through across the river, and even though you can pretty easily take Zagreb with it on turn 1, don't. This tank division is critical in taking all of the objectives in this mission on time, which is why it should only take that supply hub next to Zagreb, and thus cut the only supply line that feeds the north of the country. This is why you should just wait a little before you take Ljubljana. The tank division should continue onwards towards south, because its goal will be Sarajevo. The motorized infantry and tank divisions next to Virovitica also break across the river and drive straight south. With some help from the Hungarians, it's actually rather easy to take Osijek on turn 2 and then continue to the southern part of the country, which is where all of the remaining objectives are left. In the south, we've got another of those red herrings that we've heard so much about. The two motorized divisions are positioned as if they should be attacking Belgrade, but the city is occupied and they're separated by a major river, which they cannot cross even with HQ abilities. In fact, Belgrade is the most difficult objective in this mission, and if you have an active paratrooper card, this is a really good way to use it and make your life much easier. Otherwise, send the two motorized infantry units to support the Hungarians in taking Novi Sad, and remember the motorized and tank divisions we left at Osijek? Well, their order is to advance towards Belgrade and take it, because the city is flanked by a minor river uh, on that side. Also, the tank division that did not take Zagreb must advance towards Sarajevo, and since you're given a precision strike ability, as soon as you can destroy the bridge behind Sarajevo so that its defenders run out of supply. Finally, the units of Panzerkorps Kleist have only one objective to take, and it's two Skopje, dealing with which on time requires two strong tank units. Just make sure that you protect your flank around Nish and don't let the Yugoslavian forces interrupt your supply lines.
I think Morita is the most difficult mission in the Balkans, and some of the decisions you make early in this operation, the invasion of Greece, will decide whether you can take everything on time. There are a few things to make taking those far, far away objectives down south rather easy. Most of the Italian troops will not participate in this mission, so feel free to take as many steps and specialists as you can from the fortified units in the deployment phase and reinforce the guys who are not fortified who you will use as an attacking force to advance towards Monastir Pass. On the German side of things, the tank division and the motorized infantry division are next to Blagoy of Rod must go west, break through, and advance towards Kopje, because that source of supply is critical for the rest of the mission. Plus, on turn 3 you will get an additional tank division near Skopje, so that place better be captured by that point. Move the rest of your troops towards Thessaloniki, keeping in mind that the Greek AI is rather sneaky and can counterattack the supply lines at your initial positions. Taking Thessaloniki on time can be a tricky task, so make sure that your strongest unit, especially that tank division, are as close to Thessaloniki by turn 3 as possible. Kavala can be pretty easily taken by that infantry division in the east and one of the mountaineer divisions from the west. I found the two infantry divisions in the far east to be completely worthless, so just strip them of their supply hub and don't attack with them at all. Once Thessaloniki and Monastir Pass are yours, you've got to clear the vectors of attack. One is the Italians moving towards Ioannina, which I recommend you to bolster with one of your tank divisions, and don't forget to move your HQs as close to the front line as possible, because the AI loves destroying the bridges, and in the case of Italians, you will sustain considerable losses and will be able to replenish them with your HQ as you go. As for Ioannina itself, it's pretty inaccessible through the mountains, especially for the tank division, so I recommend going to that little peninsula north of it. It's going to be pretty poorly protected, it will disrupt the enemy supply in the region, and you can actually do a pincer move with your tanks there and capture the city. As for the main German thrust, advance along the railway towards Larissa. There will be a few Australian divisions preventing you from doing that, and they're pretty strong. This is a very good place to use the Deutschland naval support card. Just making sure that the AI is prevented from destroying the bridge to Larissa, because once you reach that city and destroy the defenders before it, Greece will be pretty much empty and all of the remaining objectives will be poorly defended or not defended at all. Meakor, the invasion of Crete and the last mission of the campaign, offers a nice change of pace and is rather easy if you're well prepared. By well prepared, I mean hogging all of the air support and flying artillery cars that you got in the previous missions because this is the perfect place to use them. All of the airfields are very much takeable on turn one. One exception is Malame Airfield, which is protected by pretty strong New Zealanders and and they are a prime target for a flying artillery strike, especially since you'll get reinforcements through that airfield. Another objective for the initial landings is the unfortunately named Svakia. This is not required, but the AI will get a strong reinforcing division somewhere into the mission, and the AI loves putting that division in Svakia because it's so well defended. Otherwise, on turn one, you use your remaining air support to damage the enemy units as much as possible, especially around here. I found the AI loving counterattacking there, and in the subsequent turns your objective will be Hanya, which you can spend another flying artillery on, like I did, plus it'll give you another reinforcing division and an HQ, finally, so your problems with supply will pretty much disappear at that point. And once the airfield and Hanya are yours, it's only a matter of time before you take over the island, and all the remaining objectives are pretty easy and not urgent at all. Good luck. 
and this is it for today. Stay tuned for part three of this series in which I'll cover the ahistoric branch of the campaign and discuss my final conclusions and impressions of the DLC, as if they're not obvious already. Anyway, if you liked this video and are looking forward to more, go ahead, subscribe, and check out my other stuff. Cheers, and good night.